So we have to remove the slide. I think slide. Could give it a speaker view before we start. This is option. My life is not great. Good evening, uh, everyone. Those of you who are here uh, at the CPR conference room and all of you who are joining us uh, online, uh, I suspect many from different parts of the world. So morning, afternoon, and uh, good evening, depending on what time zone you are. It's an absolute privilege for me to welcome everyone to our uh, first ever hybrid version of the CPR TCPD uh, post-election dialogues. It's uh, really exciting to have everyone and especially the speakers uh, in the same room after a long gap. We've had many critical elections um, in these two years uh, in under the shadow of COVID um, that have taught us a lot, uh, both about um, what COVID is doing, what it means to do elections or how not to do elections in the midst of COVID. Um, and, and of course, the impact these last two years have had on our political and social lives. We are here today to discuss the uh, five elect key state elections, um, the results of which were announced yesterday. Um, before we launch just a few ground rules, um, we are today going to talk about all election, all the states, um, but we want to remind everyone because Uttar Pradesh seems to it will inevitably dominate uh, our mind space that we are going to have a detailed discussion on Uttar Pradesh on Monday, same time, same place. Uh, so do bear that in mind um, as you hear our presentations and as you uh, and as you come in with questions uh, uh, and and comments. Um, uh, in addition, uh, the elections um, in states other than UP actually uh, that have perhaps uh, occupied less of our space in the public discourse have a huge impact uh, both on how we understand the electoral dynamics and what's and how party politics is going to shape uh, over the next few years. So we want to, we will begin today's discussion by focusing specifically on, um, this, uh, on the smaller states, then get to Punjab and then end with Uttar Pradesh. Um, so uh, we wanted to ensure that uh, all of you were fresh and focused as we discussed um, uh, the smaller states before we got to Uttar Pradesh. Um, we will start with a series of short presentations by Rahul, Jeel, uh, sorry, Rahul Neelan and Jeel in that order, starting first with uh, Rahul talking to us about Goa, Uttarakhand, Manipur, Nilanjan talking to us about Punjab, and Jeel uh, talking to us about Uttar Pradesh. We've specifically chosen this time around to keep our presentations extremely short in order to then have a discussion and dialogue. Uh, as um, Nilan said while we were talking about the format today, uh, all of yesterday, uh, all our new high-tech uh, TV watchers have got have sort of created a new kind of deck by dashboards. So we want to minimize, rather unusually for this group, uh, the data and uh, engage more in a dis in a discussion about what lies behind the data, how to interpret, how to understand the verdict, and place it within a larger theoretical framework. So we'll try and do that through a discussion and dialogue. Um, and uh, after, after which we will open it up for comments from all of you. And we'll try to take as many comments as possible, both from within the room and online. So please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will close sharp at half past seven. So to start Rahul, over to you to tell us about Manipur, Goa and Uttarakhand. Thank you, Yami. Uh, I'll just start with the big takeaways from uh, the verdict in five states and then move on to the fun state of Goa, Manipur and Uttarakhand. So uh, anyone who has uh, watched the, the results closely yesterday, there are many messages coming out from these verdicts and I'll just highlight a couple of them. 
First, one is that BJP, which won four states, and Aam Aadmi Party, which has a sweeping verdict in uh, uh, in Punjab. Uh, these four states must give BJP a shy of relief, and the reason is uh, BJP has been not doing well in state assembly elections since 2019. Uh, they uh, came back to power in Haryana and Bihar only with help of allies. Could not form government in Maharashtra. Lost Jharkhand. Uh, uh, couldn't meet their expectations in West Bengal and have yet not been able to make any inroads in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So the only solace for BJP for last two and two and a half years was retaining Assam. In that sense, these four states where BJP was incumbent, they came back to power. So that in some ways is, is, is good for them. It also basically helps them. So we, we're going to have president of India's election in July. And now the way numbers are stacked up, BJP will have a much easier time uh, pushing their own candidate. Uh, and also there are key Rajya Sabha elections uh, uh, coming up this year, which will basically push BJP's number to around 100, which will also help them uh, moving certain legislations if they want in the house. Uh, the second big message is about uh, the social coalition that BJP has created between 2014 and 2019. So it's a broad Hindu coalition, uh, which includes upper caste at the top and, and, and then non-dominant lower caste. What BJP has managed to do in last four to five years, make significant inroads among uh, the rural uh, areas, among uh, lower caste and among poor. Uh, and what also seems to be happening, and Yamini has a piece today on women voters, and she can talk more about this, that BJP, which used to have a gender disadvantage, I, meaning less women used to vote for BJP pre-2014, that got changed in 2019 when BJP got equal share of men and women. After 2019, what we are witnessing is that BJP is gaining among women voters. That happened in Assam first. Bihar, of course, it was much more because of Nitish Kumar. But in all four states, uh, now one can uh, have debates about the quantum of that gap. But in all four states where BJP won, there is a gender advantage for the party. And what are the reasons for this, advant uh, this gender advantages? Uh, I think broadly three, but again, this needs more research. One uh, is, is largely uh, to, to, to something to do with welfare benefits that has basically target, that is targeting women voters per se. Second, at, at least in UP, the BJP has managed to create this perception that whoever was ruling before BJP, women were not safe. Uh, uh, you know, this rhetoric that women could not move out after 7 p.m. So law and order became another angle. And the third is some sort of emotive connect, which is uh, bringing women to uh, uh, BJP's uh, fold. All of this social coalition that BJP has managed to create is basically moved by four factors. So there is an ideological glue that is binding BJP social coalition, which is some sort of ethno-political majoritarianism. So the logic of majoritarianism is what is binding this coalition, pushed by certain benefits in the well, uh, delivery of welfare, charismatic leader at the top, and then organizational machinery at the bottom to basically move the message, both offline and, up, uh, and online. Finally, what we also saw that Aam Aadmi Party had a sweeping mandate in Punjab and, and there has been a great game among India's political parties happening for the second spot, especially between TMC, Aam Aadmi Party and Congress. This is going to basically, AAP's victory in Punjab or AAP's national ambition is going to bring certain short-term advantages for the BJP because it is going to create divisions for the second spot. But in long term, we don't know what would happen. And, and the overall effect of this is going to be that Congress should now, given this was a really bad year for Congress again after 2021, what I expect that there would be more attrition from the Congress leadership from top to bottom. Finally, before moving on to the state, the data also, and we just got like a glimpse of the data, uh, the survey data, there are also warning signs for the BJP. So BJP won, but it doesn't mean everything is okay and people are not concerned, are concerned about economy. In fact, it's for the first time that BJP is losing its advantage among young voters. So in, even in UP, uh, uh, SP and BJP was neck and neck among young voters. The BJP was trailing among students, among unemployed. Uh, and so those concerns are there. Going forward, 
it's not easy for BJP to solve the economic crisis that is emerging. So either it solves or basically it sits back and thinks that because the parliamentary opposition is not strong enough, they are not going to bring these economic issues to the fore and BJP will keep having electoral victory. That will have another impact. So what we ha have been witnessing since last three, four years, these concerns and anxieties will actually spill over on the streets and you will see more protest on, on, on the streets going forward. Now let's, uh, after talking about protests, let's go to Goa and have some fun. Uh, so Goa, uh, basically, so, and the reason why I'm, I'm doing the, these three states, not because these are small states, but also because in these three states is BJP versus Congress competition, mm. right? And in these three states, Congress was the opposition party, main opposition party. In fact, last time in Goa and in Manipur, Congress had more seats, but because they couldn't catch flight from Delhi uh, in time, BJP people reached in time and formed government in those states. Uh, so it, it was actually like one of the reasons given that like flight ticket uh, uh, So in, 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 in Goa... So to address that, they all landed up early? They, uh, this, this time, time they around, landed up yeah. early, but... Uh, they, were needed. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> it wasn't needed. So in Goa, oh, uh, this is... And, and each of these, like if you look at these states, each of these are also some ways uh, for states, these are historical moments. Now, BJP coming back to power for the third consecutive time, right? And, and so far yesterday, the discussion was focused on that perhaps BJP has managed to make inroads in South Goa, which is much more Catholic compared to North Goa, which is Hindu dominated. And actually, if you, and actually if you look at the data, that is not what is happening. In South Goa, of course, they are rising from 27 to 28 to 29, uh, but that is basically two percentage point jump in 10 years. What's happening in North Goa, that BJP between 2017 and 2022, their vote share didn't change, but they managed to increase their sheet share by a lot. And second thing what happened in Goa is basically in North Goa, Congress basically declined. So the Congress decline in Goa is basically creating this opportunity for the BJP to emerge as the single largest party. Before election, everyone was thinking Goa is going to be a hung verdict, but Congress declined. The division of opposition votes has actually created an opportunity for the BJP in the state of Goa to come back for the first time. Let's move on to Manipur. Uh, Manipur is an interesting case study of BJP's expansion since 2014. Now, if you look at the states of North India, it has turned saffron. So yes, it's true that smaller Northeastern states are more likely to vote with the party that is power that is at, in power at the central level. But think of what happened between 2012 and 2017. In fact, even in 2014, BJP was a mere 2% party in, in Manipur. Uh, in 2017, they got 38, uh, somewhere around 35, 36% of vote, and now it has jumped further. And what has happened, like BJP's strategy in Manipur is largely basically creating mergers and defections of other smaller parties, getting local elites to its side. So now if you look at, so last time, it's a house of 60, BJP had 21 seats, Congress had 28 seats. BJP formed the government, and by the time this election took place, Congress legislative uh, size became half. 28 to 13, 15 of Congress legislators defected either to BJP or BJP allied party. The surprise of Manipur election is that JDU has won five seats. And some people were wondering, is it the same JDU which is in Bihar? Yes, it's the same JDU which is in Bihar and has won five seats in, 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 in Manipur. And uh, BJP has created this coalition of small parties in Northeast. Northeastern Democratic Alliance, which is headed by Himant Vishwasarma. Uh, and so BJP allies, uh, which are part of the NDA coalition, Naga People's Front got its own seats uh, in the outer Manipur region of five, six seats. And National People's Party, which is ruling in Meghalaya, got seven seats in, 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 uh, 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 in the state. So in total, Congress Party, which was at 28 last time, has now declined to five seats. And so given what has happened to, so BJP is number one, uh, number two party is National People's Party, number three is JDU and Congress is now number four party. So in a way, 
uh, it's again a story of Congress's sort of like decline. Finally, to Uttarakhand, and in each of these states, Congress had an opportunity to come back to power. And the reason I kept Uttarakhand to number three, because it links to Punjab story, which Neelan is going to talk about. So Punjab, there was a crisis precipitated within the Punjab Congress a year back, uh, which led to removal of Amrinder Singh. And then they took a lot of time to decide who is going to be the CM. And in the effort of choosing the CM, they made everyone un unhappy. Sidhu was unhappy. Amrinder Singh was, uh, on, of course, unhappy because he was removed. Randhava was unhappy because he wasn't considered. Jakhar was un unhappy because Ambika Soni gave a statement that uh, we can't have a Hindu CM in, in, in Punjab. So everyone among the top BJP leader, uh, top Congress leadership was unhappy. Finally, they made uh, Charanjit Singh Chani as uh, CM and he seemed to have like, done a good job in the last 100 days and seen that he might be able to pull up some votes. But who was dousing all fire for one year in Punjab? It was Harish Rawat of Uttarakhand, who should have been in Uttarakhand campaigning for his party in Uttarakhand, was busy in Punjab dousing the fire. And what has happened? Harish Rawat, who in all surveys, even after losing this election, was the most preferred choice of chief for the post of Chief Minister Singh, leading Pushkar Dhami, lost even his own seat. So that's the state of affairs uh, in, in Congress uh, and, and, uh, and Uttarakhand. And so basically, uh, the reason we also have one slide on Uttarakhand is there is not much to analyze, right? Last time, BJP had somewhere around 45, 48% uh, uh, of, 57% uh, of, no, 57 seats, which has come down to 47. Uh, but well, basically, Congress, though it's improved, but it improved by only two or three percentage points in oh, votes. So in a way, Uttarakhand was basically on the platter. BJP was having a crisis. It had to change its chief minister three times in a row. Dhami was not very popular leader in comparison to Rawat. And Congress had a good machinery. Uh, at least uh, uh, it's competitive against, uh, against the BJP, but even a state which could have been won easily got lost, one, because BJP had a big margin, but two, because Congress's main face was not present in the state, but was present in Punjab. So we now move to Punjab. Over to you, Neelan. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so um, I think Rahul actually did a good job of covering uh, some of the behind the scenes of what happened in the lead up to this election within the Congress party. Uh, so what I want to first start with is just an overall sort of demographic summary of what happened in 2022 and then move to some of the trends that changed between 2017 and 2022. Before I get into a more detailed discussion of this slide, many of you will remember that even five years ago, there was a lot of energy around the Ahmadmi party, right? And that even some of the exit polls had thought that the Ahmadmi party might form the government. Uh, it ended up falling down to the number three party in the state, um, at least in terms of vote share, um, or num you know, perhaps number two number of seats. And um, you know, it required uh, some work and some understanding as to why it seemed that there'd been so much energy around us and why it failed to convert into votes and seats for the party. Fast forward five years, I think many of us now know, uh, the uh, Ahmadmi party swept um, out of 117 seats. They won 92, I believe. Um, and uh, obviously an extraordinary strike rate all across the board and trying to understand why and how across the regions and across demographies, Ahmadi Party constructed this impressive win is sort of what I'm going to try to do in two or three slides. So um, let's start with the, the region that is actually most to the right in these bar charts, which is Malwa. Malwa has 69 assembly constituencies, the largest um, of the three regions in Punjab. The Amali party, it had been an area of strength even in 2017, that's where it had made a bit of a push. It won 66 out of 69 of the seats in Malwa this time. And you can see that uh, 
its vote share is extraordinarily high. It's at 47 percent, right? Um, Maja is the northwest part of the state. It includes Amritsar and surrounding areas. There are 25 constituencies here. Amadmi Party won 30, uh, 16 of them. Um, again, uh, this was not a place that in 2017, the Amadmi Party had really been, in, been able to break into in a major way. So this was a major pickup. Doaba, which is uh, sort of northeast-ish, um, was seen as a Congress stronghold. And even this time, it was a closer contest between the Amadmi Party and, um, and the Congress Party. Out of 23 seats, the Amadmi Party won 10 and the Congress won 9. Now, the reason why it was partially seen as a stronghold is that it is the region which has the largest scheduled caste population um, in the state. And many of you will know that one third of the population in Punjab is classified as scheduled caste, although that is split between Hindu and um, Sikh communities. And uh, in particular in the Doaba region, uh, Rahul just mentioned Charanjit Channi, um, the community that is most closely associated with him is most numerous in Doaba. So there was a belief that that would be enough to see Congress through, particularly in Doaba, and perhaps um, you know, in much of the state, despite all of the challenges they had coming into this election. I'm going to very, very briefly mention, because like literally not on any of the slides, I'm going to very briefly mention BJP and the Shiromani Akali Dal, SAD. Um, of course, Badal and uh, the SAD had been a powerful actor, a ruling uh, party for 10 years straight until 2017. Um, it is, it stands decimated in this election. Um, and so we are looking at a sea change in the state because we're looking at a, at a situation in which both the Congress party and the Akali Dal have been decimated for the first time in ever. Just to give you some sense of the scale of this decimation, um, besides 1997, I think as far back as we can look, um, the Congress party had always been over 30% 30, uh, 30 vote share, um, not this time. In 1997, it dropped to 26, um, but every election after that, it had had at least 38% vote share, right? So we understood that for the Ahmadmi party to emerge, the Akali Dal had already fallen on hard times in the last election, the Congress would have to be decimated, uh, which it was. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so going into 2017, and this is the first um, uh, of, of the slide. So the red on the left, and I, 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 I've messed up labeling it, the red on the left is 2017, and the blue on the right is 2022. Um, and these are strike rates. So the percentage of the seats that Aam Admi Party is winning in regions that are characterized, in, in seats that are characterized as urban, as semi-urban, and as rural. Now to make this classification, we have used satellite data uh, from the European Space Agency because the census data is a bit messed up uh, and it's also very old. Um, and um, suffice to say that no matter how you break up the data, these relationships hold. So, so, so you know, I don't want to get too much in def definitional things here. The main thing to see here, the thing that should really pop out at you, is that in urban areas, the Ahmadmi party had a strike rate of zero in 2017. One nothing, right? Um, out of the 20 seats that we have classified urban, um, I think the Congress won 17 if, uh, if memory serves me correct, in 2017. Um, now, the reason for this is slightly complicated. Many people do not internalize that despite having a Sikh majority, 40% of Punjab is Hindu. And in the lead up to the election, there was an association made between the Ahmadmi party and pro-Khalistan forces. And there were other reasons, right? The Ahmadmi party had not been able to build strong networks into the Hindu community. What we saw from exit poll data and obviously from the uh, election results is that the Ahmadmi party had done extraordinarily poorly among Hindu voters. And Hindu voters are very, very numerous in urban areas in Punjab. So part of the challenge this time for Ahmadmi party was that would they be able to win back 
Hindu, and by by definition, Hindu voters meant that in, you would have to win back urban voters in Punjab. And so you saw uh, Arvind Kejriwal reach out to the Hindu community in a number of ways, in a number of controversial ways. I, I won't go through some of the things that he did, um, but a lot of that was aimed at trying to uh, repair a Sikh Hindu kind of uh, coach. Fast forward to 2017, and you see that in urban areas, um, the uh, the Amadmi Party has won, has had a strike rate of 86 percent, right? Um, and in fact, uh, out of those 20, um, I believe uh, the so I think it's 21 seats that are that are urban. I think two more were won by the BJP. Just sort of make, making clear what that Hindu. Uh, connection is with, with urban areas. Now to just sort of think about this a little more carefully, um, there's something else happening with the Hindu voter in Punjab that we need to sort of take seriously. That in 2017, um, the alliance between the BJP and the Akali Dal, which had been a strong alliance for a while, started falling apart. It fell apart times. After the most recent farmer protest, the alliance broke apart completely. The BJP aligned itself with the party of former chief minister, Captain Amanda Singh. Um, and it was clear to almost all of the Hindu voters that we met on the ground when we traveled in Punjab that the BJP had little chance of uh, forming government. This created a large reservoir of Hindu voters who may have not felt attached to the Congress and that the Aadmi party could, could readily sort of bring into the fold, right? So there are two things that happened for the Aadmi party between 2017 and 2022. The first was a reach out to the Hindu communities that they were not able to break into, um, and um, a large reservoir of Hindu voters that they could possibly win. We add to that two other conditions. As somebody put to me, uh, in 2017, there was anti-incumbency against one party, the Akali Dal. In 2022, there was anti-incumbency against two parties, the Akali Dal and the Congress party, right? So insofar as there was an anti-incumbent vote, um, it was much more likely to accrue to the party. Now, the third thing, and this is something that um, our research team here at CPR has written about quite, quite a bit, um, some of you know that um, I was traveling quite extensively in Punjab and Uttar Pradesh to Ram Joshi and Ashish Rajan. Both of them are here, and I will ask them to uh, give us their thoughts in a little bit. Um, one of the things that we were shocked by was just how little actual physical presence we saw from Am Aadmi Party on the ground. So what is your typical view of a party that's going to grow between 2017 and 2022? It's going to build party machinery. It's going to have local outreach to villages and slums and so on and so forth. In fact, the opposite happened, right? All of the notable local faces within the Amadmi party um, either left or were shunted out, right? So there were essentially no regional, uh, notable regional faces associated with the party until Bhagwan Khan was named as the chief ministerial candidate just before the election, right? So the election was essentially run on Kedriwal, on the Delhi model, the ability to uh, provide health and education, and uh, almost no discernible party workers or polling booth agents. So this is a kind of party that none of us have ever seen in Indian politics, right? And um, unfortunately makes uh, some of my working papers publishable, I think, if, if, uh, if, if it continues. Um, but uh, this raises a larger question, but yes, Punjab is a unique state. There was very heavy anti-incumbency. It is a cosmopolitan state. Many people travel outside of the state or connected. Many people are connected through social media. But if a party can actually win and have this scale of a victory without putting boots on the ground, literally they were they were advertising themselves on Facebook and WhatsApp everywhere, and that's what people would tell us. Well, uh, you know, we got a message about them, or we heard that Pagwan Man is coming. Um, Somebody's can't hear. Actually, maybe why don't you come here? Okay. So, Speak so we can, uh, can you something. hear me clearly now? Is this clear? 
to somebody who said there was no audio? You just have to go back to the chat box and say. Yeah. Yeah, audio is all. Was on, on. Was on. Okay, go okay. ahead. <laughs> all right, fine. Anyway. Different <laughs> person. Yeah, yeah, but... Multiple Zoom okay. experiences all yeah. in one. Okay, so, so okay. just as a way of getting back, back to it, let me start with sort of a very entertaining story. We were in Dhaka constituency, actually one of the constituencies that Amandi Party lost. It was a seat that the Amandi Party had won in 2017. Uh, uh, on the popularity of H.S. Fulka. H.S. Fulka left the party. Um, in many ways, it's emblematic of what Amadmi party did. Anybody who could be seen as a controversial face that was associated with Sikhs or Sikh resistance were shunted out of the party mm -hmm. so that it had this sort of all-encompassing feel. There's nothing you could really pin on up because there were no local faces to pin mm -hmm. it on, right? And we talked to one of the, the, the person who was, uh, you know, sort of, uh, manning the the Amadi party booth there uh, and we said oh how did you join the party he said well I've always you know kind of liked new parties um, I had a little bit of extra money so I, I built this booth uh, then I you know I had to work hard and I found somebody from Amadmi party they put me on a whatsapp group uh, and that's sort of how I get some messages about what the party, I mean, so this is like a, this sounds nothing like an organized party and place after place, this is what you would hear, right? This is what the party organization looked like on the ground. And yet this is a party that won more than 75% of the seats in, in the state. So the question that I have for Indian politics as a whole is yes, Punjab is an extraordinary state, but the ways in which it's extraordinary access to social media, cosmopolitanism, that's of course a direction that India is going to in general. Are we moving to um, a place where certain parties with strong centralization, in this case around Kedriwa, which uh, signal the ability to give welfare benefits or infrastructure, the Delhi model in this case, health and education, can be successful through very modern campaign techniques using social media, using sort of other ways of reaching the voter individually without actually physically having to build an organization. That's an open question for us, but it's a tantalizing uh, uh, possibility. And remember the Punjab is a state where local patronage networks, the amount of money that, that, that was flowing uh, with local candidates and MLAs and polling booth agents, and honestly the mafias that they controlled, this seems like an unthinkable feat, right? Mm -hmm. And yet that's exactly what happened. Now, the final thing I just wanna mention is you notice there's this funny dip that in semi-urban areas, mm -hmm. uh, the Amadmi party strike rate drops a little bit. Let me just sort of go to the next very, very technical slide. So sort of give you a sense of, 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 of what has happened. So each of the red curves are the vote shares for the Amadmi party and the Congress party. Uh, in 2017. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, is how rural an assembly constituency is. And the vertical axis, the y-axis, is the vote shares of the respective parties. Now you can see, obviously, the Congress party was doing much better across the board in 2017, but it was largely, and it was a much more urban than rural party in 2017. And the Amadmi party was a much more rural than urban party. So in our, in our urban seats, the Amadmi party in 2017 had an average vote share that was even less than 20%, right? It was not making much growth. That's that Hindu urban phenomenon that, you, that you're talking about. Look at the left part of the graph, which is the most urban area, and look at the shift from the red curve to the blue curve. The Amadmi party vote share from 2017 to, 22, you, to uh, 2022, you see a big spike in uh, its urban vote share, right? And that's telling you that A, it found a reservoir of Hindu voters and B, it was able to bring those Hindu voters around. Interestingly, it struggled, uh, I mean, struggled relatively speaking, in uh, semi-urban areas, you can see that, that its vote share dipped slightly. And these are places where um, the Akali Dal and the Congress were able to win many more seats. So that's where we showed that there's a strike rate of, you know, 60 something percent rather than 86%. Again, in rural areas, it consolidated on its base and look at, you can just sort of see that as we get to the most rural areas in Punjab, um, Ahmadmi party's vote share is approaching 50%, right? 
right? Similarly, the Congress party, um, of course, is, is down all the way across the board. It is particularly decimated in uh, rural Punjab. So the Congress party was, was hoping for a combination of Dalit voters and Hindu voters, particularly in urban areas, um, to sort of bolster its chances. You can see that it was not able to convince urban voters. A lot of the Hindu voters that we met explicitly left the Congress party. There was another reservoir of voters from the BJP and it looks like a lot of those people went to the Amadmi party, right? Um, and so that's sort of what explains this. The growth of the Amadmi party in rural areas is of course a function of some of the anti-incumbency for the Congress party, but also the fact that the Akali Dal, which is shrinking further and further every day, had its core base in these rural areas. And, it, and as it's getting decimated, that vote had, has also shifted to the Almatni party. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there. I, I ended with this sort of very technical graph, but um, hopefully sort of giving a sense of some of the <clears throat> technical and demographic changes that took place in Punjab between 2017 and 2022. Okay. Thanks, Neelan. G, over to you for UP. Yes. And as you know, <laughs> the road to Delhi, you know, goes through Lucknow and it is slowly, slowly, you know, progressing. Slide, please. Okay, so uh, there is obviously a lot to say about uh, UP, and I'm not going to do what I'm not going to try to do a comprehensive detailed uh, presentation as uh, um, I usually do, uh, it could take us, you know, too much time. But I just want to underline a few aspects which I think uh, may have been uh, sort of overlooked in all the commentary that we have heard in a mass of commentary and information that we've been bombarded with uh, on UP since uh, yesterday and, and through the campaign um, and, and, and look at you know what information can you know a few map and charts can can give us. So first of all any conversation about elections I think should start with the conversation on turnout and participation because we know that uh, uh, fluctuation in, in, in participation do have an, a, an impact, can, can give us a measure to uh, the, the degree of mobilization and disaffection of you know, supporters of various parties. And in the case of UP, there have been actually a couple of controversies or questions raised about turnout uh, in this particular election. One was the declining rate of participation as the election was moving from uh, west to, to the east, uh, phase, phase wise. And also a more minor but yet important uh, controversy which was raised by an article in Indian Express that there was a drop of registration of uh, young voters uh, in this election. So first of all, the distribution of uh, turnout in the map on the left shows you that you do indeed have, you know, these uh, westward, west to, to east, you know, variations. But if I were to show you this map for previous elections, it would actually show you the same. So these are sustaining trends that uh, participation in uh, eastern UP tends to be traditionally significantly lower than uh, in, in, in Western UP. Uh, there's a number of explanations for it. Uh, it boils down to the idea that there has been historically, politically, much more churning between parties and uh, between uh, different group and class represented and participating in politics in, in, in the West compared to the East. If I were to put a map of uh, party or caste strongholds, uh, you would find most of them actually in the east and in central uh, and in central UP, uh, and so there's a broad idea that you have slightly more stable patterns, uh, political patterns in the east and in the west, more competition in in, in 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 the west, leading to more participation. And indeed, if you look at the map, the variations are not very very clear. But if you look closely, you see that the highest participation was registered in in clusters in western UP and in Rohilkhand. Uh, Western UP, of course, his uh, 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 hot battlefield uh, uh, for a number of reasons that uh, need no um, much detail here. Uh, and Rohilkan is really the area where you have the largest uh, share of uh, Muslim population, about 30-31% of the overall population. 
And so you see that uh, some of the areas that are more affected by uh, the politics of polarization tend to register you know, higher uh, participation. And on the right, you can basically see the variations. In green, in shades of greens are you know, the areas where participation, participation increased in the recent election and in red where participation um, decreased. And I want to draw just your attention on the fact that participation decreased more and, 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 and more intensely again in Eastern UP. And when you see the next slide, uh, you will uh, find that it actually has some bearing on the, the uh, results. Nope, yes. So, um, Few things can be said about uh, the maps here. On the left, this is just you know party-wise um, winner. Uh, it's a slightly less uh, orange map than in 2017. And what is interesting, I think, in this map are you know to look at you know what are the clusters or the subregions or the areas where uh, the SP and its partners have been you know most um, competitive. And there you see that the part of the state that has been the most affected by communal violence since 2013, but also most concerned by uh, the farmers protests uh, in, uh, over the past year and year and a half, have produced that small cluster of uh, RLD seats, uh, <coughs> uh, which uh, goes to show that there has been an impact uh, of the farmers' movement, uh, and there has been an impact also uh, of the politics of polarization in that particular area. Uh, the second cluster uh, is immediately on the right in Rohilkan, that's the Rampur, uh, Swa, Swatanda uh, region. This is Rohilkan, this is, this is where you find the seats with the largest um, share of Muslim voters. And these were these are seats where traditionally both SP but also the BJP usually does very well because there's usually a flurry of Muslim candidates leading to uh, cross voting or, or, or um, uh, cross voting you know between Muslim candidates leading to the victory usually of a BJP candidate. What we see in this election is a significant reduction of this cross voting that would indicate a more cohesive Muslim vote at the local, at the constituency level, translating into greater representation of Muslim at large. I will show you a chart about that later on, but a greater strike rate uh, for um, the Samajwadi party. Uh, what that area also shows is that basically the SPRLD alliance worked but it baffles me that so much ink has been spilt on that alliance when you realize that this was really a very local phenomenon. And so the RLD uh, uh, SP alliance worked, but only in, in, in very small parts of the states. And the RLD being a sub-regional, even a local party, had very little, if not nothing, to offer in uh, the other, uh, in the rest uh, of the state. Then you can move towards uh, lower Doab southwards, and then you see another usual Yadav Belt, Menpuri, Jaswant Nagar, um, stronghold uh, of the uh, Samajwadi party. And then you, if you move eastwards, you see that uh, the more we advance in, in, in phases, the more the uh, SP became um, competitive. Uh, and the more seats actually it won. On the right, you basically see the seats that have changed hands. All the white seats are the seats that have remained held by um, the same, um, uh, no, sorry, uh, in white are the seats that are, that are retained by the same party, 271 of them. And you see that the SP succeeded in winning 75 seats. Uh, wrestling 75 seats while retaining actually quite a large number of its of the seats that it previously uh, held. You see that the BJP interestingly uh, does not win a large number of uh, new seats. The BJP really rested on its previous performance. Uh, it has retained most of the seats that it was holding, you know, previously, which beats the usual anti-incumbency, the usual churning that we see in UP politics. 
Um, and so at the end of the day, not that many seats change hands, but most of the seats that change hands were concentrated in um, Eastern UP, which is the part of the state where you have uh, a lower Muslim population, where the politics of which is less, less or somewhat less con lesser concerned by the politics of polarization compared to uh, the East. And so this idea that the Samajwadi party can only perform where you have large Yadav and Muslim, and Muslim population actually uh, is not, uh, is not uh, true because uh, the sociological composition of these uh, subregions are actually quite uh, different. This is also the area where uh, those major uh, or important uh, caste-based lower OBC parties uh, are also present and, and, and also did uh, perform. Next. And so if you look at the, the evolution of vote share and the evolution of strike rate of uh, uh, the main alliances, you know, phase by phase, you see that uh, even though the SPRLD alliance did well in Western UP, the BJP scored its highest vote share in that area. And that's polarization. Polarization does not mean complete dominance or hegemony, but it means a, a sort of a clean cut uh, separation uh, of the electorate on sociological line. And it seems that it's what you know, we have seen in, in, in Western UP. Then of course, uh, it was still a massive victory for the BJP. It still has you know, the characteristics of a wave victory. And therefore you do not see massive variations in terms of vote share. Uh, across uh, across um, phases, uh, <clears throat> but it's interesting to see that uh, the SP actually performs its highest vote share, not necessarily in Muslim dominated area, not necessarily in the Yadav belts, uh, even though it also does well in these uh, areas. And in terms of you know strike rate, you see that the gaps remain you know somewhat considerable. It's only in phase seven that the uh, SP and its partner, but at this point it's only SP and uh, the BJP and its partner are basically neck to neck, 50-50. But otherwise, uh, the difference of strike rate uh, remain uh, considerable, which account for uh, the great variation in terms of seed performance between the two alliances compared to their vote share, where you add the vote shares of partner uh, of allied parties uh, actually not as wide as uh, it might seem um, otherwise. Next. Okay, so this chart was prepared by Webov, so give me uh, five seconds to, <laughs> to, actually read it. To, actually, to actually read it. But um, yes, so phase wise, you know, what we see is that um, also a sign that this was in a way a polarized election is that uh, victory margins tend to be, you know, fairly high. Uh, they were higher uh, in the first phase, which means that whoever won, won with a really large margin and you didn't have that many uh, closely contested fights uh, in those seas, they either went one direction or the other, and it sort of, you know, sort of stabilizes um, after. If you look at the variations of victory margins party-wise, you find that the BJP and its partners win with much higher margins, 12, 13% victory margins, uh, compared to uh, the SP and its partner, which have, you know, margins around seven. Um, and uh, to answer immediately to Harish de Modern's question, uh, the victory margins are indeed lower than in, uh, 2017, in 2017. 2017 was a complete sweep. Uh, you had a very highly fragmented uh, opposition. Uh, the BSP necessarily being at a much higher level than it was in this election uh, also sort of contributed, the, fragmented, the, the fragmentation of the political space contributed to higher victory margins. Uh, but that being said, you can't really say that this was really a close election. I don't have the exact figure of uh, close election uh, by, by seat, uh, but the number is not as high as um, expected. Next slide. So the last two slides is just to indicate, uh, I mean, those are two, you know, topics that are, you know, close to my heart is uh, representation of uh, marginalized groups, both Muslims and, 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 and women. 
And uh, so what we see is that after hitting, you know, uh, all time low of Muslims representation in 2017, there has been a, a small you know, um, increase in representation, which comes from the fact that uh, there was a consolidation of Muslim vote, you know, behind uh, a lot of uh, SP candidates. Uh, the complete routing of the BSP uh, shows that the usual patterns where uh, Muslims in some area choose to consolidate, consolidate between one or two parties. This is something that we haven't observed uh, this time. And, um, and data that have, that have circulated uh, recently about electoral behavior does indicate that uh, the Muslim voters voted very cohesively uh, in favor of the uh, Samaj Wadi party. But I would guard uh, our audience to you know, read that small increase of Muslims representation as a sign that after all, you know, things are not so bad or things are sort of going back into the you know, uh, a positive direction, uh, because this inflection in Muslim representation is the uh, also outcome of the fact that uh, politics is more polarized than ever. And it's therefore function of the fact that the SP overall performed better. And so in its wake carried a few more Muslims legislators. Um, uh, <clears throat> and so we should be careful, you know, in the way we interpret those figures. And on the right, uh, I think the axis makes uh, the increase look you know, quite spectacular, but there's no deny that you know, from the early 90s to uh, 2022, over a period of uh, 20 years, there has been a significant increase of nomination of women candidate um, in uh, UP, of course, uh, and of representation as well. The two uh, lines are you know, uh, basically quite contiguous. Uh, of course, in 2022, uh, those numbers have varied thanks to Congress, who nominated nearly 40% of um, women candidates. It boiled down to 38.5, but we can round it up to 40. That's okay. Um, but with, as you know, a very, very um, little effect. So if uh, there is no time to really break down the data here, but if I were to show you the breakdown by party, it would basically show that both BSP and Congress did slight progress in nominating women candidates. None of the uh, uh, BSP women candidates obviously were uh, elected. A few were elected on SP ticket. Uh, the BJP did not increase the number of um, tickets. So the point here is that you really have to go into the detail before uh, to go beyond the impression that uh, a, a chart based on aggregate data, you know, can, um, can give you. And so just a couple of concluding um, thoughts on the um, UP election. And I don't want to uh, go into too much detail and try to anticipate also the question that I'm sure people will have. But um, a lot of people have seem, seem to be surprised that the BJP succeeded in increasing its vote share, uh, given the uh, state of the economy, the, given the discontent about the situation about you know, unemployment, uh, the COVID, the successive COVID waves, the way it has been mismanaged, um, and et, uh, et cetera. First of all, there is. Some, something of a mechanical effect that when a multipolar uh, political scene becomes somewhat bipolar, it has the effect of, there is an, a redistribution of votes across both parties usually. Uh, we don't know yet exactly how much votes of the BSP, that, or the vote that the BSP lost, the SP gained versus the BJP, but arguably uh, that uh, those BSP supporters split support between the two parties. Some voters went to the BJP, others went to the SP, that had the effect of uh, lifting both votes, uh, sort of speaking. But also what is very striking in the, in the BJP result is to what extent, even though they have lost a you know, number of seats, uh, they have consolidated uh, the social coalition that they have uh, constructed over time, over the past three, four elections, uh, the three, four elections that they've actually won. And so even though we need more information, we need to wait for the Lochniti um, survey uh, results to, to, be, to be out, 
it, uh, it would seem that uh, the BJP not only has progressed, but has probably kept most of the voters that used to vote for. And therefore, the SP who did a brave campaign, uh, they, 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 they probably did the best campaign that they could possibly do, uh, they could possibly deliver, um, succeeded in many ways at increasing their vote share substantially. This is the best performance that ever for the Samajwadi party, and they've tripled the number of seats, so this is not something that you can scoff at. Uh, but they have not been able to break that uh, social coalition, or even forget breaking even at, you know, knowing that that social coalition that um, the BJP has built through uh, the various means that um, Rahul uh, described uh, in his introduction. Um, and therefore, and again, the data on electoral behavior, vote uh, uh, community-wise and caste-wise, you know, voting indicate that this was an intensely uh, polarized elections. We've probably never seen the Arab and Muslim voting in such large proportion for the SP, and uh, it would appear that uh, the uh, lower the votes from lower BC communities has indeed consolidated also, right? And so there is something at work here. Uh, now we have a series of elections, and so we're not that we're not anymore in at the stage where we can talk about turning point, but we're talking about consolidation of trends which have been built over a long period of time. So I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. Thanks all for three fascinating presentations. Thanks also for not sticking to time uh, because uh, that did ensure that uh, we learned a lot from what all of you uh, had to say. We were planning to have a sort of moderated Q&A and then open it up to the audience, uh, but keeping time um, in mind, uh, may I suggest that the audience just put, uh, keep adding their questions and Weber, if you can send them to me and we can, uh, I'll try and weave them into a conversation so that we stick to uh, half past seven. And I will also give those who took the trouble to trudge all over uh, to CPR despite Zoom um, uh, to ask uh, some questions as well. But um, since we said that we would uh, spend more time on UP on Monday, and we have to tempt you to come back on Monday. No, you're not off the hook. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, let's, let's start our conversation by going back uh, to uh, the, 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 uh, the three states um, that Rahul, uh, you began uh, the, the, the discussion today with um, uh, Goa, Uttarakhand, Manipur. Um, to ask you two questions, uh, I think that would be important for us. In some, uh, at one level, all three were important from the perspective of understanding what's happening to Congress, because Congress was very much in play uh, in all three states. As you say, these are uh, states where Congress could actually have won. But in both Goa and in Manipur, there's also uh, um, two slightly divergent things that are happening, and I, it'll be interesting for us to hear your reflections on this. In Goa, you see the entry of new political players. So what used to be a, uh, a two-party contest now becomes a multi-party, um, Admi Party is breaking in, um, is an important sign of that, and the TMC played a role. Um, how does that, so, so you're seeing a slightly different context in which uh, it's, it's now becoming multi-party and it's external parties that are entering and not local regional parties that were entering, which is the usual way in which uh, a multi-party contestation seems to have occurred. And in Manipur, you're seeing a consolidation of smaller parties, as you described uh, with the BJP, um, and that is undercutting uh, the Congress vote. So can you tell us a little bit about what we can learn from these two states about what is the emerging dynamic of inter-party contestation and Congress's ability to manage or not manage that. Okay, thank you, Yami. Actually, uh, it's like Goa was always multipolar. So both these parties, uh, which we thought up and Trinamool Congress is making a big entry. Uh, those big entry was limited to social media and newspaper analysis. There is no change in Ahmadi Party's 
vote share in in uh, goa they had six percentage point i think 0 0.05 increase this time uh, they managed to win uh, two seats though uh, whereas trinamool congress didn't uh, make any headway in in goa so a large portion of votes and seats remained with one with bjp congress and the smaller uh, mgp and other like goa forward party and other kind of uh, players so basically what's happening is that bjp is gaining from the decline of congress so the pattern which began in 2014 at least from goa and manipur is clear that whenever congress is in competition with the bjp bjp basically takes away most of, of the things so the reason why bjp looks so dominant uh, in the national scenario is be basically because in the like a large part of india madhya pradesh chhattisgarh rajasthan gujarat is congress versus bjp competition mm. and bjp basically crushes congress wins almost 90% of the seats mm. uh, and so that's what happened in both goa and uh, uh, manipur it's a congress decline there is not big change uh, uh, in, in basically regional party distribution uh, entry of new players in as i said goa hasn't taken place what you can say that in 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 manipur or jdu came but an npf and national people's party were there even in the last time and this jdu is there today will not be tomorrow it keeps happening in northeastern states there was a point in time in Arunachal Pradesh when JDU was also part of, or RJD had four, five MLAs, and then JDU was part. So you know, it's just like like these parties keep coming and keep going. But this interesting. In case we see, uh, make a little louder. Oh, sorry, what, if we see what happened with AAP initially in Punjab, also. so TMC and AAP stay in Goa. So what happens with AAP in Punjab? Will that change? Like you know, over time, we don't know. It's true, true, true. Uh, so, yeah. Very much possible. In Goa, if AAP stays the way it stayed in Punjab, see, remember, like Punjab break in 2022 for AAP is coming after eight years. Uh, AAP made, like, they won four MPs in 2014 and all four came from Punjab. So AAP had presence in Punjab since 2014. Then they made a lot of splash in 2017. They became, they were the principal opposition party in, in the house. So the gain is basically incremental. And if AAP stays, there is a possibility. And this is what AAP's target is. And this is what we might see in Gujarat and Himachal Pradesh later this year. AAP is going to slowly cannibalize Congress party. Yeah, and that's why I said there is chances of now attrition. Yeah, I just oh sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I would just add something just very quickly to what Rahul said. So I agree with everything that he said. That you know, at the national level, this is a phenomenon that we've been seeing for a long time. Rahul mentioned in 2014 and 2019 when we have head-to-head -head contests between BJP and Congress, BJP wins more than 90% of the time. Its strike rate is over 90% against the Congress, not as high against other regional players. Right now. It is still the case that in a large swath of the country, there are direct BJP Congress fights. So in terms of the national picture, it is clear that opposition unity or not, uh, there's not much of a game to be played if the BJP continues to have a 90% strike rate against the Congress. Mm -hmm. What is interesting about, I think, what Rahul is saying and what we're seeing in these elections is the phenomenon that we associate in, with national politics is now something that we are starting to associate with state level politics when BJP and Congress go head to head. Right. I mean, you remember that in 2018, we weren't saying this about Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, right? So the question is now, as uh, the BJP has honed how to run a campaign on Modi, knows when to make things national and when to make things local, does the kind of gain that you've been seeing in the, at the national level start manifesting at the state level? And I think the real sort of question that we have for the opposition, if we're saying with the state game, is that, look, in some sense, and Rahul has actually written more about this than anyone else, right? That when the BJP sort of collapses in a state, it never really comes back, right? It's 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 Congress. Congress. Oh, Congress. Congress. Sorry, con con Congress, not BJP. Uh, BJP. <laughs> so, when the Congress when the Congress collapses in the state, it never it never it never really comes back. Whereas, like for instance, AAP, we thought after 2017 maybe they're done. They, they they sort of came back. And the real sort of question I have about national national state politics is that. As we saw in Punjab, where the Congress in some ways imploded, um, what happens if that starts happening in a state like <clears throat> Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh, 
um, one of these sort of heartland states. What is the opposition party that comes in? What does that opposition space look like? I mean, I think that's a big open question we have about where the opposition space goes from now. Yeah, you want to add the, something to that? And what you can add to that is, you know, not only who can emerge as an alternative opposition, you know, uh, in those states, but who can do that within two years? Yeah, yeah. right. If you no longer need party workers. But that's so, yeah. so that links to a very important uh, issue, Neelan, that I think that you brought up uh, in your observations, particularly about Punjab, uh, that it is possible uh, with a completely broken or invisible local party structure to uh, create uh, a vote bank, uh, it, which is a very different kind of politics. Um, and uh, so is it you know, one has always traditionally, or the framework, the challenge for Congress has always been, how do you build the party bottom up and uh, uh, build its party workers, especially when you think to back to the conversation that happened in 2019 in trying to understand the BJP vote machine, the, the electoral machinery and how relevant the local party cadre is to the election. And frankly, I think even in UP, uh, the local party worker plays a very, very crucial role. Um, yet you have a party that shows its ability to do this without all of that. Is there um, this centralized structure? Are there lessons in here in a funny way for the mm -hmm. Congress to learn? Because the Congress argument is we need to build from bottom up. And so we are going to keep sitting in UP and lose year after uh, election, after election, after election. Mm -hmm. uh, but the logic is we need to build bottom up. Whereas Amami party seems to suggest that you can sweep in and use new modern ways of elections mm -hmm. Uh, to build, uh, to build voter uh, connect. Uh, so, so I mean, two parts. So, I, I'm not sure what Congress can and can't learn, but well, I'm sure. just, what, I mean... but what, but but what, um, but um, at least you know what we can learn from what 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 the what the Aam Aadmi Party did. So, one way that I think of the Aam Aadmi Party is that in many ways, it's a very concentrated form of a strategy that we associate with the BJP, right? So. It is highly politically centralized, which is something that Modi and Amit Shah have done to the BJP. It is a very modern party. It's a very high tech party on the ground, which the Congress isn't either, right? Um, in terms of you know how it reaches out, in terms of social media, so on and so forth. I don't see necessarily where India is today, and you know compare that to Punjab. That maybe in a year or two that this applies all across India. But as we go forward, it is. A, it's an interesting question about how opposition can very quickly uh, break into space. One other sort of very small point I would make about this that, you know, I've written a paper recently with three other co-authors, um, Sumitra Badrinath and Dipabli Chatterjee, who's here at CPR and Devesh Kapoor, about the conditions under which you see women and men voting differently or expressing different political preferences in the same household. And the condition seems to be that when women have access to information separate from other male uh, male members of the household. And so one of the challenge, classic challenges for a party was the television set. Everybody is watching the same channel. Your source is actually the same. If women are able to go out of the home, but we know mobility can be restricted. One of the things, sample sizes are still small, but you do start seeing that social media is starting to have this kind of effect. Women have access to different networks when they're in digital space. Mm -hmm. So one of the other questions that we have is that as campaigns modernize, mm -hmm. um, are we going to be seeing some of the phenomena that Rahul already noted that we saw all across the states that we're going to see greater gender distinctions even mm -hmm. within the household in both choice and preferences? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I, uh, Yamini, I think on the organization question C, AAP's victory in Punjab happened in extraordinary circumstances. You have to, you cannot deny the emerging structure of competition in which AAP managed to take advantage. So you cannot uh, basically repeat uh, uh, AAP's model of breaking into a state in normal times. Mm -hmm. Two, organizations become much more important when you lose election. Right, so you can win election, but what happens when you lose an election? And if you don't have an organization, then you will be basically JDU in Arunachal. 
Well, yes and no, because ARP mm. lost in 2017 and rebuilt itself up in Punjab without that base. Right? Re-unbuilt itself. Well, unbuilt <laughs> itself and then <laughs> re-emerged. But it took eight years and also... Yeah, so exactly. That's so what you think, it's so. ordinary circumstances. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That can happen only when that happens, there's a change even nationally. Yeah. But it has to be a reputation of everything that's all existing. I mean, I think, yes. I, I mean, I agree, obviously. I mean, I think it is an extraordinary change. But the story that we've had about Punjab is there seems to be uh, extraordinary anti incumbency for one party. So then you go with the other horrible party. Then that mm. party gets anti horrible anti incumbency. You go with this horrible party. So the fact that a party can break into a system like that is a, it's a, I mean, we now say that there are extraordinary circumstances, but a priori, what we know about Punjab and what we know about local patronage networks, no one would have imagined, like if, we, if I were advising a party uh, before all of this, how do you break into Punjab? I wouldn't say, don't build any party networks, right? <laughs> but, um, in, in fact, but, Neelan, that also brings up another important point that, uh, that, that you, you, you've spoken about in, in other writings as well, which is that um, in many ways, the role of that intermediary has changed quite dramatically, even in a place like UP, where there is a strong party cadre on the ground, um, uh, partly because of the direct benefit transfer story. But it also has another very interesting feature, which I think we all uh, witnessed a little bit uh, in our travels together in Uttar Pradesh as well, which is a lot of the anti-incumbent uh, sentiment uh, translates into anger towards the local MLA, but it doesn't translate into anger towards the leadership of the party. Um, and in some ways, the leadership of the party manages to then hold some of the glue of that election together. At least this is some of what we what we heard. So is the, uh, you know, so, so I mean, it brings up two, three important things about traditionally the role of the local party cadre, what role is it playing today? Um, and how does that uh, shape the internal dynamics of party structures uh, going forward. Ishi, you want yeah, to come in first? So if I may on that, so a couple of thoughts. So first of all, political parties have changed drastically over the past years. They've become professional, more, far more professional. And some of part, some parties and the BJP first among others have transformed themselves into uh, pure electoral machines. And in many ways, up is also a form of pure electoral machines, though it has very different feature than what we are accustomed to, right? And so that that uh, on, on its own is something that contributes to, um, you know, redefine the usual role played by local cadre, local bosses, uh, because in an electoral machines, uh, the process, the, 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 the organization is far more centralized. It's far more, it's also more disciplined. It's also more standardized. And as other parties have sort of followed Q, you know, with the BGP and have also attempted to become more professional, more, more, more reliant on data and experts. And uh, we've heard a lot of complaints from these local cadres, like we are bypassed. We are trying to build these machines where you can talk to voters without us, without having, without our intermediation. <laughs> And that sort of uh, also, it, it, it's also contributing to the kind of politics that we have now, where you have you know, strong leaders emerging at the national, but also at a, at a regional level, who make take claims on having a, a direct relationship with voter to form an attribute of populism. But obviously, as we know, populism is not just, you know, an ethereal virtue or quality of, you know, a candidate or a political leader, but it's sustained by particular modes of organization, uh, which is something which is something that we are um, seeing here. So let me just, sorry, right. since we do want to pick up a few questions uh, from the audience uh, as well uh, into this, um, and I'll throw it at you, and then of course you, you, can, you can pick up on some previous thread as well. Uh, one of the questions is about uh, the role of caste. Um, uh, you know, uh, Modi's sort of speech yesterday, development triumphs over, uh, over caste politics, um, but there is a little bit, there is more to it than that, as your data uh, is pointing out to as well. Uh, so some reflections on that. Um, and a linked uh, question um, is sort of trying to understand 
um, you know, the uh, whether or not the Dalit Bahujan coalition of 2019 um, has been neutralized. Uh, oh, so, sorry, I'm going to just read the question because I, I didn't have my specs on. But uh, uh, how has the BJP social coalition performed well electorally while other social coalitions have not performed well electorally? Well, if, so, I, if I could, so on the last questions, uh, both social coalitions performed very well. Uh, if, 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 if the numbers that we see, you know, are to be believed, uh, the cohesiveness of, you know, Yara voting for the SP, Jata voting for BSP, Muslim voting for SP is, you know, very, very high in the first two cases, highest we've ever seen. It's just that it's not enough to win an election. Uh, the social coalition of the BJP is simply much, much larger yeah. and is captured or is attracted, pick your word, uh, not just by uh, gesticulating, you know, cast, cast, you know, in front of them. Part of it is direct caste appeal. And we know how, well, candidates are selected essentially on that basis. There is a lot of micro-targeting of caste. There has been... Uh, a politic of patronage of caste organization by uh, the BJP in Sang Parivar in, in UP and other parts of the Hindi belt and 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 you know for 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 more than a decade now and so these 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 practices of course you know are, are paying off today but uh, those social coalitions are built are built through a variety of means a very variety of modes of mobilization that include welfareism, that include welfare, or if you want to call it welfare populism, that include also leadership appeal, that include also nationalism, that includes also yeah. uh, the, the range of facets that a party like the BJP offers and that gives opportunities to its voters to choose which aspect they want and possibly ignoring some others uh, and, and, and give them you know, their um, support. If you look at the outcome, the outcome is very polarized. It's something that we've seen also in Assam, right? In, 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 in recent, uh, in recent um, election. And uh, so in order to build those broad gas, gas uh, coalition, you need to go through cars, you need to use cars, but you need other things as well. And, and uh, the SP and the BSP have built their success on their ability to nurture a core electorate, which they could combine with whatever support the candidate could bring. This is a model that led them to victory in 2007 and 2012, but at a time where uh, you would get a single majority of seats with 30% of the votes, which is utterly insufficient um, today. And so I would say that SP, both SP and the BSP, but more so the BSP are sort of prisoner of that model of doing politics uh, that they associate with their you know, past uh, victories, but which prevents them from uh, appealing, wide. appealing much, much more widely than, than they do not. So this brings up one more uh, question that's come up uh, many times actually in, uh, in the audience questions and that there are actually two parts to it. And if anybody in the room would like to uh, ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, and I'll pick up on that next. Um, I mean, of course, the question of uh, the female voter uh, base uh, is, is on everybody's mind. Um, uh, and, and there's several questions around whether this is entirely about welfare schemes or is it about leadership? Uh, but one important question um, uh, embedded in this is about the extent to which uh, this is also, this, this emotional connect with uh, the leadership uh, also has a link to uh, the Hindu majoritarian ideology. Uh, and I think there's a larger issue here that goes beyond just the emergence of the female voter as a significant uh, player in, in electoral calculations. Uh, which is, uh, you know, we talk about that there are multiple sets of things that are happening in what is ultimately shaping the electoral outcome. But at the heart of it is the, is the project of polarization, the, the Hindu uh, Hindutva ideology. It's showing that, that there is polarization as Gilles very effectively showed us through his slides is very, very visible. It's sharp, it's getting sharper. Um, but how, uh, you know, some are choosing to look at the other aspects of what has contributed into this to say there's more than Hindutva. Uh, others are saying it is Hindutva and looking at other aspects is actually undermining the core Hindutva story. How do all of you interpret that? Maybe I can start with Rahul, come to you, Neelan um, and, and Gilles, and then if there's an audience question from within the room, I'll pick that up before we close. But please keep your answers short because we only have 10 minutes. 
very shortly, basically that's the glue that binds, binds the social coalition. coalition. In fact, in 2019, in the multivariate regression model, that's with three stars. Uh, other <laughs> things are just there in the model. Hmm. So, and, 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 and you can, and now it will be basically PR of the argument I've been making. There has to be an ideological message without which yeah. nothing of this will stand for a long period of yeah. time. And so what 2014 basically did is, uh, uh, it was a critical election building of the social coalition, but that's like basically the blue which is binding. So short answer. Yeah. Neelan? Uh, yeah. Agree, agree. No, no, look, I, I, I think there's no doubt that um, the popularity of the BJP and what Yogi Adityanath explicitly represents is Hindu-Muslim polarization. It was coded in the electoral language as law and order. If you pushed a little bit harder as to what law and order meant, it was very clear. Um, you know, I've thought about writing a piece where the first line would be not in my village. I think I've told you about this, right? <laughs> so even when I traveled to Muzaffarnagar after the riots, and I said, were there problems between Hindus and Muslims? Said, not in my village, but in that village or over there, right? And so what I find fascinating is that we do a lot of work thinking about how local uh, processes of adjudication, village politics, sort of make communities come together, prevent conflict. And part of where a lot of this polarization comes from is the ability for somebody to say, I'm voting this way, or I'm doing this way, or I have this anger because of something that is not happening in my village. That's happening over there, right? Um, so, it's an, so, so I think beyond uh, the ideological glue that Rahul uh, talks about, I agree with, right? I think we also have to grapple with the technology of messaging, yeah. right? Mm -hmm the ability to construct a narrative based on some small event that happened on the Bangladesh border, another small event that happened in Madhya Pradesh, another small event that happened in Tamil Nadu, to build an overall narrative that either Hindus are, an attack, are, 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 are under attack or that secularism is ruining chance. You know, so the ability to construct narratives through technological means, I think this has dramatically changed over the last decade. And it plays on exactly this not in my village phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what I, I, I agree with what Rahul and Niranjan said. And what I can add is that um, Hindutva functions as it, it produces a certain you know, narrative, a certain binding um, form of identity, uh, which has been made compatible with other forms of identity. Yeah. Right. Uh, we used to say that caste is the antidote to Hindutva because caste fragments Hindus. Not anymore. It's. I mean, it's. It's. It's become much more uh, complicated. And 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 therefore parties that mobilize on the basis of you know one of those side variables against you know that machine that mobilize using these tropes that are so encompassing and so effective that speak to uh, both emotion, but also resentment and also prejudices, because these also exist, they are deep seated, they are deeply rooted in society. Uh, that makes the task of challenging the BJP very difficult. And my last remark uh, would, is that if you look at the last few cycles of elections, which are the parties that have succeeded, not just to challenge the BJP, but to defeat the BJP. Uh, they are parties that uh, presented to voters an alternative binding form of collective identity, which could be also combined with the politics of welfare redistribution yeah. and yeah. personality politics and, and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. a form yeah. of, you know, regional authoritarianism as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and these are regionalist parties, yeah. right? It's Tamil Nadu, it's West Bengal, to an extent it's also uh, Orisha. Uh, where they have uh, where they have presented themselves as defender of uh, a certain idea of a regional identity, which is grounded in culture, which is grounded in language, 
uh, the DMK presented its fight against the ADMK BJP Alliance as a, a, a struggle to preserve and you know, to save and to protect the, the, the Dravidian civilization, right? They, they spoke in civil, civilizational terms. And, uh, and, and these are, you know, uh, the tropes that, uh, you know, succeed at not only posing a challenge, but also defeating yeah. Yeah. BJP. Yeah. The question is, uh, uh, these are limited to regional identities, right? And therefore, it's also why the Trinamool, you know, it's not as easy for the Trinamool to expand as it is for AP. AP has, uh, uh, doesn't really have that sort of identity baggage or that, that, that but, or package rather, but also pro, uh, pro, um, proposes ideas that are encompassing, right? Uh, the, the new model of governance and uh, for, yeah. for, 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 yeah. for instance, which is also something that a lot of people from diverse background, including varied class background can recognize themselves. Yeah. And the great question is to see whether that, that can expands. also function. But I mean, in some ways, the female voter becomes or is also part and parcel of that encompassing. But I think I, I will just say one thing on the female voter, uh, which is that a lot of the love for Modi comes from the Hindu female voter. The Muslim female voter is much more silent on that mm. front, and that's an important uh, distinction to bear in mind uh, as we talk about the emergence of the female water. Mekla, you had a question, which is the last one I think we can take, bearing in mind that it's already half seven. So a quick one yes, from you. Um, first to say, I mean, literally, and it's just wonderful to be back in the yes. center. I'm also to have this back here. And, and after so much analysis, one really was wondering what you guys would come up with. And it has been really, really interesting. So thank you very much. Um, also, uh, since I know that we're doing this on Monday with UP, I actually want to ask about the other states uh, a couple of questions uh, to close. One, just taking your point about regionalism, the Northeast is interesting. Mm. And now you mentioned that historically the Northeast, and it's not just small state phenomenon, but they are overwhelmingly also dependent mm. on the center for many kinds of, you know, mm. fiscally and another. Uh, they mentioned, so I'm wondering whether there, even though there's a strong regional identity politics, you know, happening, the alliance sort of with the center or with any mainstream national party becomes quite important. And is that why we're seeing a very different, you know, there are regional parties, but they're in coalition often. And then it's a, so is that what is happening here, that it's a center directed sort of thing when it comes? Uh, although there is a very strong regional dimension to, and, and within the Northeast, the specific states have very different regional stories, too, of course. So that was one. And then the second was, you know, we're talking a lot about can you win an election, or at least can you win one election in the way that AAP has won it, right? In a moment of extraordinary collapse of two parties, but also then, you know, very consciously depopulating themselves of the local faces who might be problematic and providing some sort of pristine developmental agenda rather than a local politics one, which is quite different from how they were in Delhi, right, when they started, which was this going to each mall and trying to do local plans and, but you can't govern that way. So I just thought as a way to close, what is your sense of what is going to happen now? In the sense that you know, usually you have some transition from your campaign to your governance, um, and AAP has to now do that. So somebody sent me a thing saying ministers have gone from Delhi to Punjab today, and you know, you it's not the Delhi model will not work in Punjab per se. You have to think about the Punjab model. So just to think about what that transition might look like now for AAP um, as it moves from this very strange sort of. Kind yeah. of you want to ask the Northeast and I take Punjab? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no I, look, I, I, yeah, let's do that actually. Yeah. That's, 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 okay. So, look, uh, I do think that in the Northeast, um, in particular, we have seen that alliance with the center is a critical um, variable in the, in the way that parties function. There is, of course, um, access to funding. Um, there is the relationship with the center vis-a-vis -vis reserve land, vis-a-vis -vis infrastructure, right? There, there, there are complicated but explicit demographic and structural reasons for that. I would just add to this sort of variables that are related to this. Um, a character that Rahul mentioned briefly, but we've not talked about enough, but is, is Himanta Bistro Sarma, right? And, and what he means for the BJP in the Northeast. Um, he 
um, of course, cut his teeth in Assam with the Congress, another Congress defector, but also a master coalition builder, master negotiator, and most importantly, masterful in control of large amounts of money, right? Um, uh, he is known for that. He is known for that in Assam. He's known for that in the Northeast. And um, to have not only a party with the financial resources of the BJP at the center, but also a character who is so good at extracting and managing money in the Northeast gives the BJP an extraordinary advantage um, in building these kinds of coalitions and engineering defections as they need to. Okay, uh, on, on the Punjab question, yes, uh, it, there would be a problem in governance, not because of AAP does not just have a problem of organization at the moment that they will have to do uh, going forward. But to my mind, this 2022 election was a very crucial election for Punjab, especially after the normal patterns of competition got restored in 1997. Uh, uh, and the reason why it was important because the established social coalitions on the ground got broken this time, right? So you had a Hindu Jatsik coalition, which was maintained by Akali and BJP. Uh, you had uh, a coalition of uh, Dalits and Judge Sikhs, which was maintained by the Congress. So the social coalitions on the ground got basically churned. You had farmer movement, which is happening, which also did another sort of like mobilization. And then AAP enters in a big, big way uh, and basically sweeps the state, right? So uh, in a way, in a moment of frenzy, certain things happen. <laughs> But 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 elect after that basically the hard part begins as you said right like winning an election and governing a state uh, or uh, and a state like Punjab uh, given the kind of financial uh, uh, difficulties uh, this state has and especially the kind of promises that has been made to basically win this election it, we are like Punjab I'm not saying it's border state and all those things which was created but it would be really really hard time uh, especially when you move in so quickly uh, the elite structures uh, the bureaucratic structures how you align them it will be a long haul before AAP settles down in Punjab so moving to Gujarat and can they win that all of those are basically very far-fetched dreams uh, at the moment and they will also have their internal power struggles once power comes no one listens to anyone. So uh, with uh, 92 uh, MLAs, uh, will Bhagwan Man uh, listen to a person who has 62 MLAs? Yeah. Right. So uh, these yeah. things will be. Full state with police. Huh. Thank you uh, to all of you for what has been an absolutely fascinating conversation, as expected. And a reminder to everyone that we'll dive deep into UP uh, and uh, pick up some of these broader trends that are emerging uh, from today's discussion too on Monday, same time, same place. Thanks again and see you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you, everyone. All of you for being here in person. And we'll be more. Yes, I know. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes.